Okay, well, I'm going to start off with um, some reality. We've all experienced natural disasters, right? You're Californians. How many of you have been through the... Any of you lived through the 71 earthquake? <laughs> oh, wow, that's amazing. Um, how about the 94 earthquake, 93, 94 earthquake? Yeah, okay, so if you're a Californian, if you're not and you're on uh, Zoom with us today or watching virtually, you really miss out. We shake things up so well here. <laughs> Well, but it doesn't matter where you're from. It could be Houston or Louisiana. It could be Florida or something. What do they get? Hurricanes, tornadoes, you know. They, everyone has their natural disaster. Insurance companies call these acts of God. And technically they're right because nothing can happen without the sovereignty of God. But they're not like acts of God in divinely special ways. They're just natural outcomes of a fallen world fallen world is broken, so we're going to experience a lot of natural uh, disasters, if you will. There, this is just natural deterioration of living in a broken, fallen world. They're actually parts of Genesis 3, the curse. Ever since uh, the curse, not only did we curse ourselves, but the whole planet got cursed. Uh, what Romans 8 calls the planet is like in a slavery of corruption. You know, it's, it's kind of not doing great great so it doesn't matter whether you're righteous or wicked you're going to experience natural fallout through some natural disasters i point that out because i want to make sure you understand the difference between these what i might call like indirect judgments on creation like in general and the more direct special uh targeted judgments that God is going to talk about today in Revelation 8. These are judgments on particular people at particular times. There's nothing, so to speak, random or general about them, super specific. So though we experience hurricanes and earthquakes and floods and let's not forget fires <laughs> here in California, uh, these specific judgments are very, very purposeful for God. They're not just natural outgrowths of a fallen world. These are intentional with, with purpose. And they show God's righteous wrath against a sinful people. And by the way, without going into it, there's lots of this throughout the scriptures, right? If you go back to uh, Noah's time, God uh, brought a judgment on the people. They became so evil, um, God had to like do a do-over. Uh, we saw that in Sodom and Gomorrah. We saw it with the plagues in Egypt. We've seen it with the Babylonians. Uh, the list goes on and on. But all those are foreshadowing the major judgments that we're now seeing in the tribulation. Those were like mini judgments of God. Uh, today we're going to get to some of the, the big ones because God is decisively going to try to get the attention of a wayward, I might say, woke, worldly uh, humanity. He's going to, again, not just try to torment them. God does not have any pleasure even in the death or destruction of the wicked. It's not something he enjoys. He doesn't relish it. But he's going to do what he needs to do to get their attention. And I don't know about you, but Sue could attest to this. In my life, God has done some wild things just to get my attention. I came to Christ after a major car accident while I was studying in, in Germany when I was 17, you know, a life-threatening accident where, you know, I survived and God's like, got my attention. It's like, okay, I'll pray to receive Christ. Um, so you might have experienced from the first time you came to Christ or there's other times in my life, God seems to take a two by four to me. Um, I don't know if I'm a little dull or a little bit dense or just, I respond much better when he really gets my attention. He's gonna try to get people's attention now because we're at the end. If you look at the game clock, it's like under a minute, people, like this is it. You know, this, you, you got to come to me or it's going to be too late. So he's going to try to do that. It's going to be challenging because, as you know, we as humans are a stubborn lot. We have spiritual blindness. We're self-willed. We're certainly self-centered by nature. Uh, we have an inborn habit to disobey. Have you felt that, Jared, with your kids? Have you noticed? Just an inborn. It's not your fault. It's not your wife's fault. They, they, they automatically want to test things. They automatically want to push the limits. Um, and we have a sinful bent against humility and submission. That's like part of our broken 
DNA. Just trusting and obeying is super hard for us. You might even hear people say, well, that's not like me. We know. We read about you. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it's hard to trust and obey as a believer. That's with the Holy Spirit in you and a desire to please God. For unbelievers, it's going to be super hard and super difficult. They're groping in the dark. They're stumbling in ignorance. You can just see that by watching the news. It's, it's just almost f f so funny how they try to make sense of life. So it's going to be even worse for them. But God's going to try to get their attention. He did this with Saul. Remember Saul of Tarsus? He literally knocks him off the horse on the Damascus Road and has to get his attention. <laughs> Like, he was a murderer. I mean, he was evil. But God's like, he wants people to come to Christ, and he'll do what he needs to do. He blinded them. And uh, he ended up, uh, you know, transforming him, and he became obviously a great preacher of the good news. So these harsh judgments are symbols that the world is coming to an end. So if this is your first time here, or you're new here, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Welcome to the bridge. The world's ending. Just someone had to say it, you know. It's winding down. Now, don't live in terror. Us believers, we have a lot of hope in Christ. You don't need to be frightened by it, but you need to know a reality, and that is the clock is, is ticking. This study of uh, future things or end times, eschata is the Greek word for kind of the end, end things. So theologians have a whole domain of study called eschatology, um, Eschatology is the study of end times, and that's what we're looking at. We're at the end, uh, the end of the game. Daniel ten times mentions uh, the time of the end in his book. Jesus four times says the end of the world. In fact, in, in uh, Matthew 24, it says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Heaven and earth are going to pass away? Mm -hmm. that's gonna, there's going to be a lot of, it's going to get hard. But I'll make a new heaven and a new earth. I'm going to remake it and stuff. This is mine. But you guys abdicated responsibility with Adam. And you, you were usurped by Satan. And it's a train wreck now. So it's, it's going to go through some tough times. Peter says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. First Peter 4. So there's a lot of places in Scripture you can go that talk about in the end it's going to be kind of a meltdown situation. Now, by the time we reach here, chapter 8, which we're in today, super interesting because there's all kinds of noise going on throughout heaven, people worshiping God and stuff happening on the earth. But we're going to have a, a holy hush is going to come over everyone in heaven before Jesus opens what is now the seventh seal. Remember we had the scroll and each seal opened a judgment. We're on the seventh seal. And he seems to open it in a way that everyone in heaven could kind of see what's on it. And they're going to go silent. I mean, there's something so sobering about this passage we're getting into. The, the judgments coming are going to be so traumatic and horrific and so unprecedented that even heaven's going to be kind of rocked uh, when they get a revelation. And of course, we'll be there uh, if, uh, if you're a believer in Christ. All the judgments we're talking about, there is no judgment. There's no wrath for believers. So I believe we will be raptured out before all these tribulation events unfold. But Hebrews 12 says, we who are in heaven are like a great cloud of witnesses. And we can cheer those on who are on earth. So even now, while we're on earth, and there's times you're, you're feeling weak or you can't like, you don't think you're going to make it. Picture the stadium of, of heaven filled with saints that have gone before you and they're cheering you on. Hang in there, Dave. Hang in there, Beth. Hang in there. You know, you can do it. Um, Keisha, hang in there. Mike, hang in there. Like, uh, fight the good fight. We've gone before you. We've done it. You can do it too. So those of us who are in heaven, I think we'll be hushed as we see, oh my goodness, what's going to happen to the people left on earth? Super sobering. And I'm going to be super interested. <laughs> my wife said actually uh, last week when we were looking at our diagram, I think I made the statement like the heaven part is not my favorite. I'm really looking forward to the eternal state. And uh, she was right. She's like, well, why did you say that? I mean, heaven's going to be cool. I'm like, it's cool, but 
I'm, I feel like I'm going to be more interested in what's going on on earth. You know, it would be like, this is super cool, but our kids, if they're left, or neighbors that are left, anyone who, like, maybe is still here, it's like, I know that it, we're counting down now. Like, I'm going to be interested. Like, come on, accept Christ. So, anyways, that was just, I sidetracked. Okay, so today, as we jump in, before we uh, read uh, Revelation 8, I do believe that this is eerily close to a judgment on what I believe are the God-rejecting, progressive, Green New Deal, climate change, carbon footprint, if you will, earth-worshipping environmentalists. I do think since there's a series of judgments, this initial judgment is going to be on those who've exchanged worship of the creator for worship of the creature or the creation. Um, and we see that in the news every day. I mean, the wars are going on and you got people saying, gosh, is this going to affect climate change? I'm like, you're kidding me. That's your top concern in the Ukraine? Okay, wow. Um, so I do think for Christians, responsible stewardship of the planet is super important. And so I like environmental principles that protect the earth, and I like recycling and thoughtful, reasonable planet care, if you will. But there's a lot of people who drive that right off the cliff, and they've come to worship the earth. You know, let's have an earth day and worship Mother Nature. And it, it just can get weird, and I think God is like up to here with it, at least by Revelation 8, he's like, I'm over it. You want to save the whales, you don't give a crap about the souls. You want to protect wildlife, you don't even protect the unborn. Done with that. So over it. Um, it's so twisted and perverted and depraved. They want to hug a tree, they don't even hug people. Their, their concerns are the depleted ozone layer and pollution and the destruction of the rainforest and endangered species, whales, spotted owls, you know, the California condor, we got to have that. They don't give a hoot about your endangered freedom. They don't give a hoot about your endangered faith. They were global cooling, then they're global warming, now they're climate change. I, I, pick a lane. Um, they sacrifice to the planet, they honor and re revere the universe, but they reject God. And uh, consequently, these environmentalists, these evolutionary Darwinians, these pantheists devalue man. They overly value animals. Do we go there with dogs or, and plants? And they completely ignore God. And again, God has tolerated this He's tolerated uh, Fern Gully, Al Gore, New Age nonsense. We could go on and on. But we've reached a point where he's like, done with it. Everything you worship, I made. Everything that you've become so important, you've rejected me, the creator. No more. They've had enough time enough decades, enough centuries to kind of pound their pulpits and spew their dogma. But God says no more. So with that, let's jump in and see what chapter 8 has to say. If you have a Bible, I'm in Revelation chapter 8. We've got 13 verses. I'll read them, then we'll try to unpack them a little bit, see if we can make a little more sense of them. You ready? Got your device, your Bible. Some, I love the old-fashioned... It's actually in the book. Uh, but some of you are so digitally savvy. I know it's on a, a device or a platform, so that's great. Follow along. Okay, Revelation 8, starting in verse 1. Uh, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven. For about a half an hour. 
And again, John's getting this vision. He said, I saw the seven angels who stood before God and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel, this is an eighth angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, they went up before God from the angel's hand. And then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and then hurls it to the earth. And there came peals of thunder and ramblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and it was hurled down on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea turned into blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star ablaze like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water and the name of the star is Wormwood and a third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of them turned dark a third of the day was without light and also a third of the night. And then as I watched, I heard an, 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 an eagle. It, it was flying in the midair, calling out in a loud voice, Whoa! 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 To the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet's blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. Such a fun passage. Uh, oh my goodness. Okay, so let's unpack this. We have our work cut out for. This is, ironically, the calm before the storm. We've seen a lot of activity. Uh, we've seen a lot of noise. Remember our vision of, of God in heaven uh, included a lot of worship and praise and hallelujah and 24 elders and angels and myriads of uh, angels and thousands and thousands. You couldn't even count them and martyrs going holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And now this is completely contrasted in the beginning of chapter 8 as Jesus now says, I'm ready to open the, the seventh seal. And everyone's like, <gasps> Complete hush. When he, verse 1, Jesus, the Lamb, opened, that is cracked open, opened up that seventh final climactic seal. There's seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. When he opens the seventh seal, there was silence, complete silence, open mouth, penetrating silence in heaven for like a half an hour. This is as close to a dramatic pause as you can get. I mean, everyone in heaven seems to be aware when he opens it it's like someone presenting the Academy Award, right? And they haven't said it yet, but they open it and the camera's right on the em envelope and everyone reads the answer beforehand, right? They're seeing the seventh seal and they're 
just hushed. All the exhortation completely stops. All the alleluias cease. All the music is put on pause. No one says a word. Uh, this is the silence of like solemn anticipation. And the trumpets that they're going to, to hear are going to have an ominous sound just as this is kind of like an eerie silence. I'm not aware of any silence in heaven prior to this. I am aware that Psalm 76, 8 says, You caused judgment to be heard from heaven and the earth feared and was still. I know uh, many prophets do talk a little bit about this. Zephaniah says, Be silence in the presence of the Lord God for the day of the Lord is at hand. Like, shh, zip it. Zephaniah 2.13 Be still before the Lord all mankind because he has roused himself from his holy dwelling and God is rousing himself as this seven seals open everyone's like oh my gosh here we go now I do think um, as ominous as this silence is it's probably a joyous silence too for the saints when we're not on the earth so we see what's going to happen on the earth but we're not going to be there and there will be a sense that that day has finally come um, the last of time has actually arrived that that we're going to be vindicated that Satan's going to be defeated that sin will be vanquished and that Jesus Christ is going to reign forever and if you've been through some hard times or life's been difficult this will be really encouraging for you think about remember we already had a bunch of tribulation saints people who came to Christ already during the tribulation and they're saying to God up in heaven we've already read this how long are you going to wait Lord till you like bring things to justice and make it right and I'm sure they're completely quiet now because it's like you don't have to wait any longer. If you've been raped or abused or violated, uh, Bernard was here last week and we were looking at a video of 52 Christians that were literally on a phone film, you know, that were executed at gunpoint in Syria last week because of their faith. He told his wife, like, this is just for Dave and I. He says, I, I need you to see this. this. This is happening today. And they pushed him in. Gone. Pushed him in. These are people that are like, we're not recanting. We're, we're. And for these people, I think there is going to be a silence. For all those times you wish like vengeance, like make it right, Lord, come on. Now it's like, oh my gosh. He is going to make it right. We're not going to tolerate the craziness. If you feel like the world's getting crazy, it's going to get crazier. But he's not going to put up with it forever. And there is a, probably a silent like, wow. So when someone wrongs you, perhaps there's already an application here, like walk away, shake the dust of your feet off because it's going to be more tolerable, Jesus told the disciples, in Sodom and Gomorrah than for those folks. Like when someone wrongs a believer, Jesus takes it personally. I feel sorry for people who wrong us. It's like, mm, I want to knock you out right now, but I want to leave room for the vengeance of God. <laughs> Am I the only one? Uh, I'm not alone. I'll ma hey, thank you for making me feel sor sort of healthy, not real healthy. <laughs> I got a, a, this is total tangent, I got a sword, you know, a big Roman sword from a guy I mentored years back, and it's in my office. And I don't even think I've shared this with my wife, but I do have a fantasy that someone will break in our house in the middle of the night, and it's like, I may have to use it. I, I mean, I practice when no one's there and stuff, but I'm like, if you come on my property, I'm going to do it, okay? But if it's not on my property, I just have to watch the craziness and go, you're going to take care of this, Lord. This is so nuts. So nuts. So anyways, that's verse 1. We've got to press on. Verse 2. 
So John sees, uh, you know, this vision and there's this incredible silence. And then he says, and then I saw the seven heavenly angels or messengers. This has the definite article with it. It means seven like special hand selected angels. Some call these the presence angels who stand before God. This is just a reminder that angels do have a ranking and order. There are cherubim and seraphim and archangels and thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities and powers. We don't have to get into all that, but these are special angels. These are like green beret, like hand select seven. And it's, I don't know, in verse two, it could be a little bit like a silent movie because it doesn't say there's any noise yet, but Jesus sees like everyone's like, shh. And then there's like these seven angels and then there's like seven trumpets that are given one per each of the angels as we're kind of watching. And the uh, salpinx is uh, the term for trumpet here. It, it's not a musical instrument for entertainment. It's a special trumpet used to call the Israeli assembly together to congregate, used at the, the last judgment. It, it's, it's used in Numbers 10 to call Israel together. It's used in 1 Corinthians 14 to call soldiers to battle. It's a special kind of instrument. Mount Sinai after Moses got the Ten Commandments, a trumpet was sounded after they marched around Jericho and the walls fell, they blew a trumpet. When a king is crowned or elevated, there's a trumpet. John started Revelation by saying he heard the voice of Jesus and it sounded like a trumpet, like something like attention getting, something sober. Even when he was called up to heaven in Revelation 4, it says he, he heard a trumpet, you know. Um, so this is going to be an, a special seven angels with s seven special trumpets. Um, and I think they're quiet again because it's like, here we go. Um, verse 3, another angel, this would be an eighth angel, who had a golden censer. That's like a big golden bowl. Um, if you will, uh, like a saucer-shaped pan, came and stood at the altar and he was given much incense to offer, a great quantity of incense. So there's a little bit of emphasis, like we're talking a lot more incense than normal with the prayers of all God's holy people on the golden altar in front of the throne. Now you have to know some Old Testament here, but if you go to the Old Testament tabernacle, the temple, there would be an altar outside where they would put incense and stuff and they'd have sacrifices done there and then you'd go in and then there's the Holy of Holies, which only the high priest could go into, but in front of that was a smaller golden altar. He'd take a coal, the priest would take a coal from the altar in the outside courtyard, put it in a censer and bring it into the small golden censer and you'd see the incense. And the incense is symbolic that it's like your prayers. It was a symbol that just as you, you know, smell the sweet aroma of this incense, your prayers are sweet to God. And they go up and he hears them and he, they, he notices them. He logs them. He never forgets your prayers. Never. Never. So verse 4 says, The smoke of the incense from the hand of this eighth messenger, the fragrant aroma of it, together with the prayers of God's people, they went up, they rose up, they billowed up, they ascended before God from the angel's hand. So he's just trying to let you know we're totally sobered because these judgments are coming. But before the judgments come, he's linking that the judgments actually are linked a little bit to your prayers, which is, Lord, what the heck is going on here? Why aren't we like dealing with inflation? Why aren't we dealing with the uh, pro-life why are people voting this way why is our government doing that why are they shutting us down why are they forcing this why are they mandating it's like you you can't let this stuff go he's like i hear you your prayers go up to me i'm going to take it all into consideration in my time not your time but it is time so you can count on your prayers are have been archived. If nothing else, you feel like he hasn't answered them yet. They're duly noted. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be our, thy name, thy kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And like, he's like, I'm going to answer that right now. I'm going to bring that to earth right now. Verse 5, then the angel took the censer 
filled it with the fire from the altar, and this totally shocks me. I was not expecting that. He takes the censer and then hurls it to the earth. Throws it at the earth. Pours it is the nicest translation. Visually, pouring is like, but that angel is serious. Like, he is like, anyways. And then peals of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. I mean, the whole planet is shaken up. God's going to judge the earth. He's going to take it back. He's going to take it over. He's going to vindicate his saints. He's going to eradicate sin. He's going to defeat Satan. He's going to exalt Jesus. And we're starting it right now. You already heard the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the galloping. There's already been a lot of damage, but we're getting serious now. Verse 6, And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them, to blow them, to initiate the judgments. So we haven't even gotten to the seven angels yet. We got that eighth angel that like hurls the incense down to the earth and says, Here's the prayers of God's people. They're coming. They don't have to wait any longer. You had your time. You locked them up. You beheaded them. You, 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 you mandated. You canceled them. Done. God's heard the prayers. Get ready. You're going to hear some stuff. And I'm going to do some stuff. I'm done with it. So, seven... Trumpeters get, angels get ready. And of these seven trumpeters, there's going to be these seven judgments. Remember the four horsemen followed by three more seals? Now we're going to have four trumpets followed by three more trumpets. He breaks the seven into a four and a three. The first four are natural. He's going to deal with stuff on the earth, the environmentalists, the pantheists, all those earth day people who reject God but like value the planet. And then the next three, which we'll look at next week in Revelation 9, are going to deal with the supernatural. It gets super eerie because it has to do more with not seas and plants and greens and ecology and atmosphere. It's going to have to do a supernatural spiritual warfare. Woo, it's going to be super intense. So again, these first four in this chapter have to do with people who are more interested in whales than souls. It has to do more with those who protect wildlife but don't protect the unborn. You know, those who are so cattywampus in their values and their cultures, he's going to try to get their attention and say, um, this is going to be a, a bad day for you Green New Deal people. It's going to be a disaster for you. All that money you wasted, all those attempts, you tried to like control the atmosphere, the temperatures, you're kidding me. No. You're not in charge. I can already, th this is my perverted mind, I can already think all the seminars and workshops they're going to have after these first four trumpets, all of the fake news trying to spin what's happening in the world. I mean, there's going to be a symposium at the United Nations on how to deal with the economy and uh, the, the atmosphere now. It's going to be a train wreck for them, but that's their problem. We're not there. We're not there. Dave, you're not there. Okay, I'm not there. <sighs> Don't get crazy. Okay, verse 7. The first angel sounded the trumpet and there came a storm of hail and fire mixed with blood and it was hurled down and dumped on the earth. And as a result, immediately a third of the earth was just burned up. I mean, it was scorched, charbecued. A third of the trees were burned up. All the green grass was burned up. Every blade of grass burned to a crisp. That's really a bummer for the Green New Deal. <laughs> like, wow, there's no green left. Now, God's done some of this before. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with, with fire. The plagues of Egypt, you know, back in Exodus had hail. I mean, this isn't brand new, but it wasn't enough. He's going to have to do it again to get their attention. There's going to be this great earthquake, and who knows what that will do. You know, crops and forests are obviously going to be decimated. Uh, massive loss of vegetation, which will upset the balance of nature, of course, and pasture lands will be devastated, seriously affecting livestock. We're talking about ruined farmland. 
which means the availability of, uh, availability of grains and vegetables and fruit worldwide are going to be disrupted. That sounds like a food supply chain problem. Who? Pff, I can't even imagine that. It's like not having baby formula or something. When would that happen? <laughs> Weird. The economy is going to completely falter. The cost of housing construction is going to skyrocket. You think lumber's going up now? Wait till a third of the trees are gone. It's like, wow. Yeah, you want to build a birdhouse? You got $2,000? You know, <laughs> lumber's expensive now. We lost a lot of it. Um, <laughs> my goodness. So this is going to be an ecological disaster. It's going to be all our environmentally atheistic friends are going to have a total meltdown. Now, when we get to the second angel, we're going to move from the earth now to the seas, verse 8. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and he says something like, he doesn't say it's exactly that, but something like a, a huge mountain, perhaps an asteroid or a flaming meteorite, all ablaze, burning with fire, perhaps kind of like a volcano or something, was thrown or flung or hurled into the sea. And then, of course, a third of all the living things in the sea and the oceans, they turned into blood. This is, again, not br brand new. I mean, God did that with the Nile in Egypt. So it's like, wow, here we go again. But there's going to be a lot of blood and, and massive pollution. And, of course, the oceans affect a lot of our oxygen. Um, phytoplankton and algae in the world's oceans gives us a lot of really fresh oxygen that's going to be a third of it's going to be compromised it's going to be it's going to be tough and a third of the living creatures in the sea verse 9 are going to die perhaps that's why there's so much blood we're talking millions of fish will be dead dolphins and whales and seals and swordfish and i don't know i was looking up i was just curious like the international whaling association estimates there's 1.7 million whales in the oceans i'm like okay a third of them that's 600,000 dead whales i'm like wow i mean that's going to affect the fishing industry get your cans of tuna right now i'm just saying put them in your cupboard right you're not going to be here why are we worried about that we're going to Surely, we're not going to be here. You don't have to worry. Don't stack up on two. No, leave it, for, leave it for our friends. We'll leave it for our friends. Because we know it's coming. When the fish are taken out, I left some tuna for you. Anyways. But it won't help you as much as the Lord. Come to the Lord, please. Please. These are warning signs like, come to the Lord. So that's the sea. It's turned into blood. A third of the living creatures. A die, and then of course a third of the ships, that seaworthy vessels, boats, yachts, cruisers, barges, freighters. Some of you work for Princess Cruises, right? Don't tell them, don't mention this, but they could lose the, the Emerald Princess, you know, or the Ruby Princess. Could, I mean, a third of the boats. I was like looking at maritime transport and they estimate about 50,732 active ships at sea or in port today. So I'm like, a third of those, that's 16,911 vessels that will be tanked and sank, probably. Of course, if a, something the size of a mountain hits the ocean, you can only imagine, we've already had earthquakes, the tsunamis, and I mean, we've seen a few of those in our lifetime already, and they just wipe things. What about the navies of the world? I mean, wow. Wow. So this is going to be a blow to global trade, uh, the supply chain issues again, national defense. Uh, this has a lot of implications. Um, okay, let's keep pressing on. Verse 10, there's a third angel. We've only got two angels so far, two trumpets. Here's the third trumpet, and John sees a great large aster. This is Greek. We get our word aster from it, asterisk, asteroid. He sees a great star blazing or burning like a torch, flashing across the horizon it fell from the sky from heaven perhaps a meteorite or something on a third of the rivers and on the springs of the water so now it's not just the seas the the third trumpet is going kind of inland now the rivers and the reservoirs and you know all the fresh water sources are going to be impacted do you think california has a drought now oh my goodness this is going to be a real problem for us and the name of the star he actually gives it the name is wormwood what does wormwood mean some of you know what is do you know ormond yeah it means bitter yeah bitter it's it's the plant with a root that exudes like a dark greenish 
bitter oil. It means like bitter sorrow. By the way, uh, Sue and I, you know, have been overseas in Russia, Ukraine. Chernobyl is the Russian word for wormwood. I thought that's so interesting that they would have that (laughs) national world disaster. That was was back in, what, 86, I think. So, oh my goodness. I'm like, this is super interesting. Anyways, it goes on to say a third of the fresh waters, rivers, springs, reservoirs, turned bitter or wormwood. They were poisoned, basically. And that happened in the Egyptian plagues, too. So again, not brand new. And many people died from the waters that had become bitter or toxic. Like, you can't drink this stuff, but people are going to drink it. They're so desperate. And then they're going to get super sick, and a lot of them are going to die. And again, our eco-political, eco-friendly political leaders, uh, I don't know what we're going to see them doing on the news, but they're going to have to spin this. I can only imagine what all the PC scientists are going to say people have to do now. Um, It's going to be... It's going to be tough. Anyways, we get to our fourth angel. Finally, verse 12. He sounded his trumpet. We're moving from the seas to the land. Now we're going up to the skies, if you will. Sun, moon, and stars. And he says, A third of the sun was struck. A third of the moon. Struck means kind of blighted or darkened. And we're going to have that tonight, right? We have an eclipse tonight. So we'll see him. Yeah, for, with the moon. A third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark, and a third of the day was darkened without light. The, the, the day was not sunny and bright. Uh, Egypt's ninth plague was like that, by the way. Um, again, some sort of massive eclipse. Um, again, we already have two like asteroids hitting the Earth or something like a mountain. We've got the the sensor stuff being thrown down. I can only imagine like the ash that would rise, the volcanic stuff, the dirt. I mean, do you remember 9-11? Just the dust? That, that was two planes, not two asteroids. And I heard some asteroid. I think I was reading there's an asteroid out there that's like a, could it be 100 miles or 100? I don't know, just a huge, I don't know what it, I, I, I didn't look it up, but asteroids are big. Um, We saw the devastation of two planes hit two buildings and the dust that, like, it took over all of Manhattan. Just, you couldn't even see. That's going to be happening. That alone would darken the sun, right? How could you see in that? It would be like temperatures would drop, of course, and uh, travel would be super dangerous. Uh, Whether it's Vesuvius or Mount St. Helens, remember that? Iceland's had their stuff. Uh, some people, uh, some commentators say this could be like a, from a nuclear exchange to what they call a nuclear winter, that maybe some sort of exchange would have happened nuclear. Could be. That's, that's interesting. But Jesus prophesied this. He said, uh, recorded for us in Luke 21, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, and the seas and the waves roaring, Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Jesus said that while he was here, while he was alive. So those are the four trumpets of the seven, the first four. Massive tsunamis, darkened skies, colossal loss of life for both animals and humans, but still limited by God. In his grace, he limits it only to a third. Trust me, he's still restraining himself. Even though like this is catastrophic, he's still restraining himself. And the situation is going to really put the governments in a quandary because no amount of government aid is going to solve this problem. No amount of relief efforts, no advanced preparation, even if God told them specifically, this is going to happen this week. Four staccato trumpets, ba-doom, 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 ba-doom. They're not going to be able to repair it. Even if you're prepared. And by the way, Christians have been raptured. So the world's going to find out, perhaps for the first time, you don't have Samaritan's Purse. Yeah, those are Christians. Sorry. Uh, sorry about the Red Cross. Yeah, that's mostly Christians. Um, so you don't have them. Doctors Without Borders, they're all in heaven. <laughs> they're watching. 
Habitat for Humanity, mm, sorry, they were mostly Christians. Hope Coalition, Operation Blessing, Salvation Army, World Vision, they're all gone. The world has no idea what Christians are already doing for them right now. They have no idea that when disasters happen, no one's counting on FEMA. They count on Christians to come in and help. We're not going to be helping. We're going to be praying that they wake up. These trumpets are designed to say, boom, 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 boom. Do you get it? Anyone else like want to play this game? You want to still worship the earth? You still want to hold your Earth Day festivals? No, no, I'm done with that. I'm God. So John sees the vision of these first four and then our final verse for the day, verse 13. As he watched, now we're talking about as, as all the celestial lights are dimming and darkness is coming over the whole world, he says, I see suddenly, God's already got everyone's attention, he heard an eagle. I don't know if this is a literal eagle or remember one of the seraphim or cherubim had the head of an eagle, so it could be an angel with like an eagle look. I don't, I don't really know, but he says, I heard an eagle, an eagle, not one of the seven angels with the trumpets, that was flying in midair and uh, mid-heaven. And he called out in a loud voice in a way that seems like the whole world heard it. Whoa! 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 Trouble, 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 doom, doom, doom. This is like saying horror, disaster, calamity. He's, he's, he's crying out. I would just say like, ay, yay, ay, you know, something like, oh. I mean, this eagle is saying you've seen four trumpets. There's three more coming. Three more woes, like bigger, more dramatic. These, this is just about the earth and plants and trees and animals. And Okay, so you, you lose the Green New Deal. That kind of tanks. You know, Al Gore's totally bummed and stuff. But it's okay compared to the three that are coming because they're going to be supernatural and they're going to come after people. I came after the land first and the seas and the stars and the sun, inanimate things. I went after nature because you guys were worshiping that crap. I'm hoping you'll come to me now because the next ones are coming after you and they're going to be demonic and they're going to be super evil. You already worship the devil if you don't have Christ. You're already part of the kingdom of darkness. You already prefer babies have the option of being terminated till the day of birth. You're already murderous. But three more woes are coming to the inhabitants, it says, of the earth because of the trumpet blasts that are about to be sounded by the other three angels. Like, this is a warning. You ain't seen nothing yet. We've got three more coming. And whoa, 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 they are bad, bad, bad. So in conclusion, the end is coming. And we need to face it. And we need to live with urgency and hope in Christ. And if you've resolved your stuff with Christ, all this is not for you. Praise God. But then it is for you. Why did he give that to us? Because hopefully it'll give us a sense of urgency to warn people, come to the Lord. Now's the day of grace. You're still in the church age, not the tribulation. You know, we all go through disasters. Life is challenging. There's acts of God, but then there's acts of God. And you don't want to be here for those. And God is going to address the God-rejecting, progressive, Green New Deal, climate change, carpet footprint, earth-worshipping, environmentalist, pantheist, you name it, whatever. He's like, I'm done with that nonsense. It's nonsense. It's not stewardship of the planet. That's terrific. Of course we all want to clean air and clean water and pick up trash and stuff like that. But you're worshipping it. It's idolatry. I'm done. And I'm hoping to rouse you. I'm hoping to wake you up. I'm hoping to give you something to 
go, maybe we got this wrong. Maybe we don't need to devalue man and elevate plants and animals and ignore God. Maybe we need to pay attention to God and elevate man as an eternal being and then care for plants and animals, but not worship them. Now, what do we do with these troubling truths? How do we leave here today? Like, what do we, I don't know. These are some of the things I wrote to myself that I just wrote, I know God loves me because I know he's been patient and long-suffering and even though we're now at a place in scripture where he's done with the nonsense, he's put up with it for thousands of years. Thousands of years. I wrote, uh, God hears our prayers. If you're having a hard time or you feel like you got the raw end of the deal or something's been unfair, he knows, he knows. Your prayers, he hears those. And you may feel like, but he hasn't done a thing yet. Yet. When he does, he will hurl the answer to those prayers down to earth and his vengeance will make it right. So hang in there. Be patient. In fact, maybe have a little empathy for the people he's going to make it right with. Like, ah. Oh. Kinds of me that scene in Pretty Woman. Remember, they don't know who she is when she's shopping. Like, and uh, they're, uh, she's like, Big mistake, big, big mistake. You don't know who I am. I, I know you don't know who I am, but I'm an heir to the throne. I'm God's son. He really likes me for some reason. I mean, I don't even like myself that much, but he's chosen me and you did something to me. And it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. But you have it coming, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna turn the other cheek. I can turn the other cheek because it's gonna be dealt with. Are you gonna deal with this? Because if you don't deal with this, I need to do some, oh, you're gonna, okay. Okay, he's going he's gonna to deal with you. So, so sorry. <laughs> this passage reminds me God does use physical disasters to communicate spiritual messages. Have you noticed in your own life when it gets hard or sick or you lose something? It's like, hmm, your prayer life goes way up. It's so interesting. It's like, huh, now all of a sudden I'm clinging to him. He, he, he does that. I mean, we're just fickle creatures. He's trying to do that with the people who don't know him. I wrote too, God's harsh judgments always have a purpose. Hardship and heartache, devastation and death always have a purpose, even in our lives right now. So don't waste any time questioning God. You can if you want. I know it's natural to go, God, why me? Why now? Why, you know? Go ahead, waste your time. But you can shake your fist at God and you can doubt him, but if you embrace reality sooner, if you accept his discipline, if you ask yourself, okay, what do I need to learn in this train wreck? you're going to be well on your way to making the most of living in a fallen world. You're not going to be here that long. Learn it. Because finally, I wrote in my own notes, God's not going to stop until he accomplishes his purpose. That's one thing that I think comes out of this. So we can choose to heed his warnings in his word now, or we can choose to harden our hearts if we want, but he is going to make his will happen. He will not be thwarted. So if you're resisting him now on something and you know he's telling you something, but you're just kind of resisting or kicking against it, or push all you want. He's not going to let go. He will win. My little two-year-old granddaughter, Kessler, doesn't know that truth with me, but I'm, gonna, I, I'm reminding her, I'm going to win. <laughs> Papa, no. Push and push, but I'm going to win. And if you don't win it when they're two, three, four, or five, wait till they're teenagers, right? <laughs> so God's going to win this one. Anyways, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Revelation 8. Challenging, but you are tired of people uh, worshiping everything but you. You created everything. The sun, moon, stars, plants, animals, this beautiful sunrise should point us to you, not worship of the sun. We're not Aztecs. We're believers. Help us not to resist you. Help us to do what you've called us to. And help us to be warned and warn others. Time is running out. The end is coming. He's patient. He's long-suffering, but not forever. And it's in your name we pray and everyone said, Amen. Amen.